thanks to the organisers for giving me a chance to talk here. Um, and what's nice about having the opportunity to talk at this workshop is that synthetic biology is very much the fun side of the stuff that we do in, in my lab. So we do mainly um, drug delivery and, I guess, classic pharmaceutical science. But we have a bit of a, a dabble with synthetic biology. And what I'm going to try and talk about is something which is rather different, I think, perhaps from uh, some of the other talks in this, uh, in this little uh, workshop and symposium. So we do uh, approach this whole field perhaps from a slightly different uh, route. Okay, so that's uh, Nottingham, of course, where the sun always shines. Everyone knows that. Okay. Um, so I can talk a little bit about some paradigms. I don't really want to dwell into this because it's been so much better introduced by other people beforehand. But then I'm going to talk about what we term CHELs and then a little bit about some uh, the interface of uh, material science, chemistry, biology, and computing, Turing test. The bulk of my talk is really going to be about how we think about polymers um, as vehicles, really, for storage and transfer of information. Of course, that's very much something that biology does uh, incredibly well, has evolved to do that. And then um, I'm going to discuss where we are in terms of trying to implement what we call a Turing test. And I want to bring that back uh, at the end to think about whether this is um, purely uh, funding for entirely uh, blue sky stuff or whether this might have some implications for material science and whether it in, in, interacts perhaps with um, plant science and um, various other aspects of biology is the sort of biomaterials chemistry crossover biology. So I'm going to go through a number of different uh, aspects of, of where this might lead. Okay, so just in terms of some paradigms, uh, <coughs> this has already been int introduced. But when we consider the engineering approach to biology, we, we can, of course, consider the top-down approach. And I think that is really where the bulk of the synthetic biology uh, area lies. So this idea of you know, the chassis and so on. Uh, and I don't need to go into that. But the area that uh, I'm more involved with, and we've seen examples here already today, is perhaps the sort of the bottom-up approach. And it very much has this interface with the sort of nanotechnology paradigms that where we start looking at program molecular assembly and really this idea where we can start looking at um, protocells, organizational units uh, built from small components with increasing complexity. So this is really where we approach it. And then the science fiction bit, all right, so artificial life and chemical cells. Of course, there's loads and loads of stuff in artificial life going back a very long time, of course. Um, but then there's still this question, can we really create wholly abiotic cells? There's a bunch of papers, I think, which um, illustrate the, some key points in each of those components of synthetic biology. So where I started out was at an EPSRC ideas factory meeting. And um, this is now quite old stuff, 2004, 2005. And it's not just for Professor Kell's benefit. This was, a <laughs> this, was a, this was a fantastic thing, this ideas factory. It was just a great thing. And it got a bunch of people together to create mad ideas um, and you know, just brought us together in, in, a, in a way that we could not have been brought together before. And through this, we came up with this a, a number of concepts. But really, we set ourselves the task of whether we could generate some kind of abiotic cell, which we termed the cell at that meeting, really. And we wanted, you know, we set ourselves a fairly humble task to, to uh, do in a few years what nature has taken 4,000 million to do. But anyway, um, and just in case uh, funders are here, then we're not quite there yet. All right. So but we wanted to avoid using existing genetic machinery. All right? So we set ourselves some, some rules of the game. We didn't want to do reproduction at this stage okay, for the first generation. But we wanted to think about whether we could generate some, some new chemistry, some wholly new chemical systems to establish components. So we have a container, we have a metabolism, we have some kind of information. So this is where we set out. And then we also thought, well, if we've done it, how do we know we've done it? All right, so how do we tell if we've got something which is some way of intelligence or some form of, of chemical system? And of course, others have been there before, and um, much greater intellects, I would suggest, and, and certainly me anyway, Alan Matheson Turing. Okay, so this is the, the classic thing the imitation game, the Turing test. So rather than saying is something, is it alive, then you do an imitation game. And again, I'm sure many people will know this. Uh, this is the idea, this great paper, the idea that you have an interrogator 
you have a machine and you have a human. And if the interrogator cannot tell the difference in the reply between the human and the machine hidden by this screen, then to all intents and purposes, as a practical functional definition, the machine is thinking or has some level of intelligence. So this is a, a wonderful practical implement, implementation, I think, of it gets, gets around all the philosophical issues of what is life and so on and says, on a functional level, can a machine think? And if it can fool the interrogator, then it can. All right, so, so it's a, I think it's a wonderful concept. And of course, we stole from this gleefully um, and we put, a, put aside this question six years ago now. And the idea here is that we're going to have our interrogator cells or whatever they may be. We're going to have a real cell and we're going to have a, a chemical cell. So this is the cell. So it's the same thing as the imitation game. And what we want to have is some kind of conversation or question between a real cell, a chemical cell, and the interrogator cells. And if the interrogator cells can't tell the difference between the response from here or from here, then we have our, if you like, our intelligent chemical cell. That was the, the concept which is all too easy to come up with at an ideas factory meeting and, of course, rather more difficult uh, to implement. So this is where we started. And this is our game. Can a cell imitate a cell? That's what we wanted to do. So actually, when you go away and think about doing it, you need to have some kind of container for your, to the basis, the structural basis of your chemical cell. Then you need to some kind of metabolism inside your system. And you need to have some kind of information. So you can exchange some level of chemical potential, whatever else it may be, between your cells and what we call cells. All right, so that's the, the simple stuff. But to do a biological experiment, and I think this is a lesson that perhaps we should have learned, because none of us at this meeting were formerly card-carrying biologists. We were all chemists originally. Um, we need to choose a, a suitable cell system as our interrogator and reporter. And for that, we needed to have some kind of accessible, easy signaling pathway, an addressable reporter system, and something which could live in the presence of our chemical soup that we were going to generate. All right, so that's, that was, these are the kind of the boundary conditions at the start. So for our containers, we wanted to make some block copolymers. For our chemical systems, we chose some quorum sensing bacteria. And it's, it's great that, that already the, the uh, quorum sense, uh, I guess the key components of quorum sense have already been introduced in, the, in this meeting. Um, some level of emergent chemistry, um, which has a foremost reaction. Um, so these are our, our key components for the, for the Turing test. So um, these are our, the key components we need to put together. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to set up an interrogator cell and ask some questions. And what we plan to have here is some kind of chemical cell. We have a bacterial reporter system. And then we're going to do a series of questions. So first of all, we're going to think about whether we can have a metabolism put inside a chemical cell. That will signal to some bacteria, which might then signal back again. And we can then think about having um, some interaction between these systems, and uh, recognition or transfer of information, and a game which will lead to either aggregation, signaling, swarming, and so on. So a variety of different um, bacterial responses that we can look at. But again, it's easy to draw a cartoon. It's not so easy to do the experiments. So the first thing we need to do is to assemble our containers. And to do that, there are, again, a number of boundary conditions that we are interested in. So we need to develop some chemistries. I won't go into those. These are all published. Um, so essentially for cell recognition, then for logic operations. Then we want to be able to assemble our polymers into some form of a container system, a supramolecular object. And again, the supramolecular association has been very, very well dealt with already today and will be tomorrow. Then we need to develop some systems where our, whereby our polymers could interact or interfere with some kind of cell-cell communication system. And then we want to see whether the polymers can perhaps somehow cross-talk with cells, either by binding to the cells or binding the signals, issuing signals, modifying signals, and so on. So the first thing was to look at a number of quorum-sensing bacteria. So we chose Vibrio Harvey because it's got a nice uh, bioluminescence response. It's a very easy system in theory to use because when it um, associates in particular states, then it uh, produces a nice uh, bioluminescence report. Various strains are available, so that's quite nice. 
Also, you can look at things like E. coli. Again, fluorescent E. coli are easily accessible in, in many labs, as you know. Um, so uh, E. coli also has um, quorum sensing response. It swarms and can signal in different ways, uh, dependent on uh, association, cell density, and so on. So the main thing was really to see whether we could generate some signals and whether those could somehow interact with the cells. And if the cells themselves produce some kind of product, can our containers bind or release those signals and then somehow interfere into that network? We also had a, a boundary condition. This is what we've been doing. Uh, this is when Ben Davis reported this uh, in Nature Chemistry a few years ago now, where we wanted to put some, some chemistries inside our, our uh, vesicle systems, which would be emergent, complex, uh, varying over time. And he chose the uh, foremost reaction, which generates some uh, quite complex products. But importantly, the, the goal for this was that these products should look like uh, cell signals, look like quorum sensing signals. So again, the boundary condition at the start was, could we put some chemistries, complex chemistries, inside uh, the, the, the polymers or the, or the uh, lipids, which would uh, generate something which would interfere with our bacterial signals. So those are the individual components. So this is where we started. We started with some biocompatible polymers, and the first question was, can we simply switch on and off the signals from um, polymers with sugars on the surface uh, with bacteria? So we generate some polymers with particular uh, recognition groups on the surface. We wanted the polymers to self-assemble into higher order structures, and then we wanted to see whether they could induce either bacterial aggregation or swarming uh, just by virtue of the chemistries on their surface. And so this is our first generation model, just to probe whether if we associate bacteria, or can we associate bacteria in a specific way, and can we then uh, bring bacteria in, in close proximity such they might start signaling uh, under our command. So this is what we did. I don't want to go into too much of the chemistry. Uh, we made a, a bunch of different polymers. The key thing is that they assemble, and you can control the assembly through the chemistry, so you can start looking at these things at either, either virus size or closer to um, uh, bacterial uh, uh, cell dimensions. So these are in the sort of um, one micron uh, dimension. And you can see these. So here are kind of mini viruses. So these are smaller than a micron. These are giant vesicles, and they can be anything um, from the size of a normal bacterial cell to that are almost of, of uh, human cells. So we can generate these with a wide range of sizes if we want. Key thing here is, what do they do in the presence of the cells? Well, if you get the chemistry right, you can get the bacteria to associate on the surface of your vesicles, so you can bring them into close proximity. You can generate uh, clusters. Again, you can switch off binding. These ones don't bind because we haven't got the right chemistry on the surface. If we tune the chemistry, we can get a certain number of cells associated with the surface. So the very first generation experiments, we just we hope you can see this. There's a cell attaching here. So this is, um, in this case, E. coli binding to the surface of a polymer vesicle. And over time, what we can see is the yellow uh, cell, sorry, green here, um, turns red as we take a dye from inside the vesicle to the outside. Okay, so it doesn't come up terribly well on the screen, but I think you can see just there the um, cell has gone red. So essentially, it was just a, a very simple information transfer experiment. So it was just the assembling of the containers. What I wanted to show with this was that you can vary the affinity of the um, containers for the bacteria. And again, you can tune the chemistry to do that so that you can essentially have um, if like kiss and run interactions between our cells and, and the bacteria. So that allows you to start thinking about whether you can tune whether cells associate, whether they become um, quarate and so on in terms of their aggregation. So what we now wanted to do, and this has been published recently, was then to say, now we know, understand that we can get, we can control certain levels of cell binding and association. Can we then see whether the cell association leads to changes in signaling? All right. So the key thing here is that we have some cells, we have some polymers. Now we know that cells by themselves, the Vibrio, when they associate into uh, certain clusters, will start signaling just through uh, cell density. So they just start signaling to each other. Now we can have polymers which will either inter interfere with this adhesion pathway or they can interfere with the quorum sensing. And we can also have polymers which will interfere by binding to this agent here, which is one of the quorum sense signals uh, for, uh, for Vibrio harvey and indeed for a number of other species. 
Here are the polymers that we made to interfere. It doesn't really matter what they are at this stage, they, um, except that they have a range of different affinities which one can design in uh, for these uh, bacteria and for the signals. So the kind of experiment we're going to do, remember we're trying to think about whether we can interfere in pathways where bacteria associate, swarm, or produce light, or produce signals. So we're either going to get the bacteria to signal because we've clustered them together, or we're going to interfere with the signaling by binding the molecules that the um, bacteria are sensitive to in their quorum sensing. So if you like, there's, a, there's a, a potential for a feedback loop, so the polymers can either bind the agent, or they can bind the cells. The cells can bind the agent. So we can have this interference in this, in this cycle. And there's a potential, if we then put these into containers, that we can start issuing signals as well. So we can introduce a crosstalk in this uh, story as well. So essentially we can tune whether the polymers bind to bacteria. So here's essentially a control. Here's ones that bind strongly, ones that uh, cluster, and ones that uh, are sort of intermediate in overall affinity. And you can do that with um, binding experiments, aggregation experiments, and so on. So we can control, to some extent, the level of, of cell aggregation and in, induction of signals. But we saw some intriguing things with some of these polymers in that with this set of polymers, so we've got a cationic charge which will help to aggregate the bacteria. Um, we've also got a signal, we've got a, a system here which will bind the bacterial signals. So this uh, catechol group, of course, will bind very strongly to the boronate systems. So the more polymer you add, the less signal the bacteria see, and so we reduce bioluminescence. So we're, we're doing a very simple quenching of their quorum sensing. But then we saw some intriguing systems, uh, intriguing results, when we started looking more closely at different concentrations of bacteria and concentrations of cells. Because what we actually see here is actually an enhancement. So actually we've brought on, we've, um, by adding more polymer, we've uh, got the bacteria to associate and we've switched on their quorum sensing rather than switching it off. Though if we add more polymer, then we go back to a situation where we, we bind the signals again. So again, depending on the chemistries of these polymers, you can either induce or you can reduce uh, the quorum sense signaling. So now we've got essentially into what might be a feedback loop because we can have systems where we can tune the polymers either to bind strongly. Okay, so they, they bind strongly to the bacteria, they bring the bacteria together and induce quorum sense signal. Or we can have polymers which just sequester the signal, they then uh, reduce the overall light production. Then we have systems where we can have both binding of the signal and binding of the cells. And dependent on the strength of that interaction and how quickly the cells are brought together, we can start getting this uh, oscillation in the um, bacterial quorum sense network. Okay, so here's just an example to see how we can cluster bacteria very, very easily. So here's a very, very strong clustering system. Here's something which essentially only weakly clusters. And here's something where we've got something intermediate. And what I want to show here is that we can simulate this. So we, we work with uh, Nat Krasnagor in the computing department in Nottingham. Um, we've simulated, and I'll hopefully show you the simulation shortly, of how we've simulated the clustering of the bacteria and the signaling at the same time. So again, what we can see here is that these polymers, when we induce aggregation, we start turning up the bioluminescence. Again, this system here, this doesn't cluster the cells, and we don't uh, induce the bioluminescence. Again, we've got something intermediate. Um, what we can see is, say, this intermediate clustering, we get an initial enhancement of bioluminescence, and then we get a, a reduction. So we have a change in the way these systems start behaving. And this is our uh, simulation. It's probably easier if I try and come out of this and show on the video. Uh, what you can see here is where we've, we've simulated. So the, the cells, in this case, we've, we've done a foxes and rabbits differential equation here. And the cells are lighting up dependent on cell density, dependent on polymer binding. And hopefully you should see a, a bit of a halo around these clusters as they, as they develop. So this is purely a, um, a simulation. But I think it replicates quite nicely what we see in terms of the bacterial aggregation and the light production um, over time. And uh, what we're now doing is, is putting this back, this simulation, back into uh, our experimental setup to see whether we can design, um, uh, whether we can extract the, the key parameters. So the last bit is really putting this all together. So we've, we've got a bunch of experiments where 
we understand to some extent how uh, bacteria sense uh, or how they do their quorum sensing, how they change their signals based on uh, aggregation state. Some of that, of course, was, was well known anyway, but also in response to uh, our uh, presence of polymers which bind agents or help induce quorum sensing. The key thing to do now to enact our Turing <coughs> test is now to put all of these components together. So polymers that can bind signals, that can assemble into uh, cell-like structures, and then which can either gate or increase or reduce uh, the aggregation or signaling of bacteria. So again, this is, we're uh, finishing the manuscript on this just now. So here are the polymers, and we put them together in, a, in such a way that they now form vesicles, um, and here they are. Okay, so they're quite small vesicles, but again, one can tune this if one wants. Now, the way that they're assembled, this is now on the outside of the vesicles, and we find these are actually very, very effective at quenching um, the a particular quorum sense signal. And so what we can also do, though, is we can incorporate uh, signal molecules inside these vesicles, and they have some degree of permeability. And that's why I asked Deck the question earlier about permeability of these uh, old membrane pores, because there's a key issue still to address in terms of the permeability of, of polymerosomes. But what I think you can see here is that when we, we put in a signal into these uh, boxes, and we can let that leach out, and we can in increase bioluminescence. When we don't have uh, signals there, we uh, essentially maintain a, a control level of signaling. So what I want to show here is just essentially a time point of where we're uh, introducing uh, signals into a system. We've got two different types of, of vesicles here. This one binds the signal very strongly. This one releases it gradually over time. And these are control vesicles, which essentially are designed not to interfere with the quorum sense system. So if I go run the sort of time course, you'll see the controls on the right essentially don't move, but we started interfering with the, the signaling on the right-hand side. So we begin to see this oscillation of, sorry, see this oscillation of, of bioluminescence in the presence of our containers. So as the signal uh, comes out, goes between a binding, so it signals the bacteria then uh, switched on, and then they switch off again as the outside quenches the, the signal. So we're starting to get this, this oscillation uh, of our uh, quorum sensing bacteria in the presence of these vesicles dependent on the signal that's issued or bound from inside the, um, from inside the polymer, uh, polymer core. So where's all this going? Um, and I think I've kept to time. The, the idea is that polymers can interfere in this, this signaling by both a, a binding and a quorum quenching mechanism. All right? And... The key thing here is that these, these processes are in, in feedback, so, so we're trying to make sure that we have um, uh, some level of, of induction of quorum sense signaling and some, uh, some level of uh, reduction of quorum sense signaling. So we're getting this um, feedback loop. We've done all the container chemistries and the metabolism chemistries and the information components in isolation, so they've all been done. We've done some pairwise systems, so we've, you know, we've, we've put some information inside containers, um, and again, we've got some metabolism inside containers, and we know now how the bacteria act on the information given from the containers. What we don't have is putting all these foremost reactions. We've got some other synthetic um, quorum synth systems as well, based on the AHLs. Um, what we don't have is control of permeability in the vesicles, and this is this is why I presented it very much as a discussion paper, because this is really the key issue for us, and I, I think in many other areas of science, is having a, le a, a level of control over... Um, you need permeability of small molecules in the presence of large molecules. You need to have uh, cell systems, which or synthetic cell systems, which have chemistries which are compatible with your um, biological reporters, and which are... which allow certain chemistries to take place inside without affecting uh, the cell populations outside. So the foremost reaction at the moment, uh, Ben Davies's group have, have managed to tune that down to pHs which are a little bit closer to normal biology, but there are still issues in terms of coupling some of those chemistries with the kinds of pH values which are appropriate for a quorum sense system. 
So these are very much in process. So where do I think this is, this is going? And I think I've, yeah, I've allowed enough time to have perhaps some level of discussion here. Um, I think we have a significant crossover in sort of biomaterials and biology in general, all right? So an engineering chemistry approach to biology I think has significant components. Uh, now, there are all these issues, okay? So this could apply um, to uh, compartmentalized materials in general, control release. So we're interested in drug delivery, but this could be uh, in many, many areas, of course, um, pest control, a variety of ways of inducing um, growth, controlling microbial infections and so on. Uh, responses to cell signals immediately lead you into sensing, it, me it immediately leads you into a whole area of diagnostics. Of course, regulatory issues and ethics are important, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it in the last two slides. But in terms of practical applications, well, obviously, one of the things we'd like to be able to do is to have something like a synthetic macrophage. Um, so where, where we have a, you know, a responsive system, perhaps you're uh, genetically predisposed to a particular disease, you can implant something and it will essentially lie dormant. It's a kind of sleeper medicine. It lies dormant until it's activated by a particular system. So that's an obvious end goal for these things. But again, in situ diagnostics and therapeutics. So the the design parameters which would allow you to do the, the Turing test that I talked about earlier um, could lead you into some very obvious practical applications. But the other aspect of this is the kind of more um, arcane, well, well, philosophical things. You know, how alive is a synthetic cell? And, you know, the what is life question. So we've been working with um, James King, who's a designer, and we um, took something to the Impact Exhibition a couple of years ago, uh, where we We've been working with uh, James King to work out, you know, how, how, you know, what is the scale of livingness of a synthetic object, okay? So, um, and what perhaps would a Chell product look like? Because obviously we can have something which is essentially non-living, but as we build in a progressive level of complexity, uh, one can have what we've, we termed a sort of cellularity scale. And as you build certain areas of complexity in, you go to something that's 100% living perhaps, you know, things death, reproduction, replication, and so on. And then we, you know, that then begs some philosophical questions. Um, you know, if you can have some of these things, um, where would our, our, you know, our cells at the moment are down here. Um, but as we get increasingly complex systems, then we build in metabolism, perhaps replication, then these are kind of Half living, and what does that mean? Tree of life, whatever that, that may be. But also, if you're in a practical application, what are you selling? You're selling a semi-living product, or are you selling something which is you know, essentially just um, uh, a bunch of chemicals put together? You know, philosophically, what, what are we saying here? So, I think this is an interesting area um, ethically as well. But you know, we're very much at this end, at, at this stage, but I'm sure that many participants in this workshop will have systems which are much further down, down the line than, than we are with our bottom-up approach. Okay, I just want to thank these people in my group, but um, uh, people that we work with. Essentially, the, all the work I talked about today was done by Paco Fernandez, uh, Joan Zhu, and George Pasparakis, and we work a lot with Ben Davis in Oxford, James King, the designer, and Lee Cronin in Glasgow, and his postdoc, Jeff Cooper. All the other people mainly do drug delivery work. But I'd like to thank EPSRC and BBSRC because uh, they funded uh, some of this work when we initially, we really only had a concept and we had an idea and they were generous enough to say, well, you know, you've had a punt, have a go. And I'd like to thank um, the organisers and I'm very happy to take questions. <laughs>